Well, thanks all for having me at the Prime 2020 meeting and letting me into your virtual world. I'm Nick Berbilis from the Australian National University. I have the pleasure of presenting the ECS Corrosion Division ULIG Award Address. I'm very honoured to be a recipient of the HH ULIG Award, and unfortunately we're unable to connect as planned in Hawaii, uh, but I hope you and your loved ones are well. Uh, today's also my birthday, so I promised myself a rain check on the Hawaii trip. I want to thank the conference organisers who put on a great show, um, which is easily accessible. Being in lockdown really uh, sucks, so if anyone needs a pen pal or someone to chat to about corrosion or anything, please reach out and continue to look after yourselves. Uh, I will give thanks at the end of this presentation, but before I kick off some technical content, I like to commence my presentations by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I work and live, which are the indigenous Wurundjeri people, and I pay my respect to their elders past and present. So whilst I'd planned on delivering an ambitious overview in person, I'm here instead going to uh, go with the format of a story, which I find works a little bit better with recorded presentations on magnesium alloy corrosion and protection. So here we go, that's me. All right, so for those unfamiliar with magnesium and its alloys, here are some images of its applications. Um, magnesium has very quickly uh, become a commodity material. It's used tripling in the last 20 years alone with a linear growth of primary production, uh, which is seen by the mashup of data that I've compiled here up on the top left. Um, at present, the principal producer of magnesium metal is China with other producing nations also listed Here's a compilation from 2017. Uh, the production in the USA has been withheld for, for many years now. But put simply, the light weighting opportunities afforded by magnesium are vast, since nobody wants to carry a heavy phone or laptop. There are also obvious energy savings and environmental uh, impact in a positive way that comes from magnesium. So a lighter car is less fuel, less fuel is less environmental impact. Magnesium is 75% lighter than steels, and here's a variety of images that show you where magnesium alloys are used. Um, I'm certain, even if you don't know where it is, that many of you are already proud owners of magnesium metal in your various possessions. But um, this is where it now gets a little bit icky. So as a reactive metal, magnesium is incapable of forming a protective surface film in environments with a pH under about 11 which effectively means any atmospheric conditions. Uh, this is seen from the dismal salt spray performance in the bottom left-hand picture. And in addition, of course, the potential of magnesium alloys is so negative and so low on the galvanic series, so um, much less than negative one volt versus the standard hydrogen electrode, that the cathodic reaction that occurs on magnesium is water reduction, such that corrosion results in copious hydrogen evolution, which you can see in the video of magnesium dissolving on the right in dilute chloride solution. And some pH indicator in that solution shows the alkalization that also occurs um, in parallel. All right, so I first started working on magnesium about 15 years ago now, um, or a little bit less, and my first PhD student uh, that's listed there, Aaron Sudholtz, carried out a project on alloying magnesium alloys with a range of diverse additions in order to see if we could reduce corrosion rates by functional alloying. In particular, we wanted to improve the corrosion resistance of the widely used magnesium alloy AZ91. The induction furnace, uh, pictured on the left um, here with Shravan, that, that did a project much later, uh, is the furnace that was used to create over a thousand alloys in the past nearly 15 years. But in the case of Aaron's work, we found that essentially anything we added to AZ91D either had a negligible effect or most often deteriorated corrosion performance and rather spectacularly, I may add. And this is largely because most metals are insoluble in magnesium as denoted here by all the gray elements um, shaded in this periodic table um, representation. Those slightly soluble are in orange, and when I mean slightly soluble, I mean no more than one per 200 atoms of solubility. And those that are soluble are in white. So if something is insoluble, it's kind of like an oil in water scenario. 
it results in microgalvanic coupling between magnesium and the insoluble element that results in very, and I mean very, high corrosion uh, rates and high rates of localized corrosion. Um, even for elements with some solubility uh, in magnesium, um, complex microstructures typically develop with high volume fractions of second phases, as depicted here in the backscattered electron image of a magnesium cerium binary alloy. So look, I'm going to cut a very long story quite short here. Um, what a lot of empirical testing has allowed us to do, and this plot that you see here, the schematic, is the result of about a dozen PhD students over nearly a decade, um, is that it shows we can make a map of how alloying elements impact magnesium corrosion. Uh, the schematic here shows that alloying effects uh, over, uh, overlaid on a polarization curve representation um, of the anodic and cathodic kinetics that we see on magnesium. And the distance of the arrows moving away from the polarization curve is representative of the magnitude of the effect of a specific element. So for example, in red, we can see iron and zirconium that live some way down that arrow towards the right move the cathodic kinetics in a significant manner um, when added to magnesium. In pale blue, we can see that calcium activates the anodic reaction a lot more than, say, tin or lead. Some elements like holmium or gallium have very little effect, and some reduce the anodic kinetics slightly, but simultaneously increase cathodic kinetics. Um, when making this plot, the most telling thing was that there is essentially no elements that studied to date that could restrict cathodic kinetics upon magnesium, suggesting what we now know is, as true in the last few years is that magnesium corrosion is under cathodic control and the cathodic reaction can proceed freely in water at the potentials of, of magnesium alloys. So mini recap um, here um, and cutting, uh, cutting a, lot, a lot of material out is, um, and, and of course, uh, I'll stop the doom and gloom after this, and, and we've skipped about 50 papers uh, worth of electrochemistry to get to these, is that magnesium corrodes quickly and messily, evolving copious hydrogen, nominally alloying additions and hence cathodic kinetics. Magnesium uh, is unable to be passivated by conventional alloying additions to date. Magnesium is under cathodic control, and magnesium dissolution involves persistent local cathodes. Um, all right, but I'm going to move on because what I wanted to talk to you then about is some fun stuff. So some examples of imparting corrosion uh, resistance to magnesium. Um, here we go. So here's the first of the examples. On the basis of a lack of elements to retard cath uh, the cathodic reaction, as we can see in the plot on the top right, an exploration into how one can poison or kill the cathodic reaction is undertaken. This is normally done by oxygen scavenging in cases where oxygen reduction is the cathodic reaction. So that would be the case of when you have steels or stainless steels or aluminium alloys. But in cases where water reduction is the cathodic reaction, such as uh, for magnesium, other approaches are needed. So at a previous electrochemical society meeting in Boston some years back, uh, a coalition of the brave was formed to uh, explore the use of arsenic, which um, in the respective lab in Wales, Geraint Williams and Neil McMurray, that is shown in the picture here on the right, had shown that its inhibition of magnesium was possible from soluble arsenic species in solution. So then the team of us down under, so Mark Gibson that you can see there, Tony and Katerina, also worked on making a magnesium arsenic alloy. Um, so here it is, um, magnesium with around about 0.4% arsenic, and uh, what was the result? It actually worked. So for the first time we saw an alloy of magnesium that had remarkably lower rates of cathodic kinetics than pure magnesium. Uh, this led to about a 10 times reduction in the amount of hydrogen evolved, about a 5 times reduction in the amount of mass loss seen, and a significant difference in the corrosion uh, morphology. This also gained a little bit of notoriety in the media too, which is, which is always nice. Um, but given the toxicity of arsenic and the fact that nobody, so not even us, wanted to make that alloy again, we explored the prospect um, of other group 14 and 15 elements with similar chemical properties as alternatives. In fact, 
interesting side note is that one of the uh, biggest signs that we were breaking norms in our work is that the Ames Lab in Iowa, um, which is known uh, and famous for being able to produce absolutely any sort of material or alloy, even refused to make a magnesium arsenic alloy for us, returning our money, which uh, we paid them to, to make one after we found that our trials work. And even they said it was too crazy. Um, and I think they were right. So what Tony did is a remarkable PhD in exploring alternative group 14 and 15 elements, um, making alloy production look simple, uh, to produce a suite of, of alloys um, that were optimized to reveal that the cathodic poisoning effect could in fact be reproduced and the combination of polarization, mass loss, uh, hydrogen evolution revealed that non-toxic, but unfortunately not so cheap, germanium was as effective as arsenic. So that's a fabulous outcome. Um, this is also seen here in a physical sense and indeed those looking um, to deep dive into this work um, can do so. There's a, there's a swag of papers on this stuff. But just recently, um, a more recent student of mine, Joni, Jody Uwono, that I uh, supervised with Nikhil Medica, who's a fabulous student, he was a fabulous student, now is a fabulous academic, summed up the electrochemistry uh, of these systems in some detail um, and also has done so with uh, some wonderful DFT modeling. Alright, so another example here that came from empirical testing is that the passivation of magnesium was not really demonstrated to date by the retardation of anodic kinetics. As any alloying that had been explored so far increased cathodic kinetics. Furthermore, the geometric misfit of magnesium surface films formed upon a hexagonal metal matrix was also a problem. So the question arose, what can we add to magnesium to alter its crystal structure and to potentially alter its surface film chemistry? So along with uh, Mike Ferry at UNSW, the PhD of Mike Yan that I co-supervised with Umay Magabi that's now at the Sorbonne explored um, magnesium lithium alloys. Um, where a BCC alloy could be made when the proportion um, of lithium additions was above 11. That was um, the area that we we're exploring that's, that's shown by this sort of uh, greeny region here. So um, 11 weight percent lithium corresponds to about 30 atomic percent of lithium. So that means 30 out of 100 atoms in this alloy are actually lithium. I'm not going to dwell on the metallurgy uh, so much that you see here, but this alloy system also has prospects for age hardening if quenched and aged. Um, and the composition that we explored is denoted by this sort of blue dashed uh, vertical line that you see in, in, the, in the section of the phase diagram there. So indeed, the alloy formed a unique nanostructure in a BCC matrix and revealed a vast decrease in anodic reaction kinetics upon magnesium. magnesium. So this was the greatest decrease in anodic kinetics that one had, had seen to date on magnesium alloys. The mass loss in hydrogen evolved was an order of magnitude or more lower than pure magnesium as well. So this plot that you see here has a, a log scale on both, uh, both of the y axes. And I've, the different uh, specimens there uh, refer to whether or not the sample of magnesium lithium was water quenched, aged or rolled and to the extent that it was rolled. So this corrosion resistance was attributed to the development of an insoluble lithium carbonate surface film on the surface that's been studied quite a lot by uh, XPS. In this particular case, it was synchrotron XPS, but also has been studied by ICP methods uh, since then. A simple, a very simple phenomenology is depicted here, but this is presently a work in progress, I want to add, and the understanding of the lithium effect in situ has posed many interesting questions as to whether or not uh, the lithium carbonate is actually the responsible um, protective surface composition when you're in solution. Um, and so, um, if anyone wants to follow up on this sort of work, uh, please uh, do reach out. This is, this is an active study at the moment. But look, variants of this alloy are presently in use in what is the current lightest laptop, which is made by Fujitsu, um, known as the, the Lifebook. All right, another interesting example for corrosion protection of magnesium alloys is the work of a student of, uh, of mine, Jarek, that was also co-supervised by Kate Nan, Xiaobo Chen at RMIT, and John Scully from UVA. 
Um, one of the challenges in coding magnesium, and noting that uh, Xiaobo Chen uh, crafted a couple of excellent review papers on this topic published in, uh, published in Corrosion Journal, is that the coating is either a barrier coating or it's more cathodic, so in other words, more noble than magnesium, such that corrosion rates at coating defects in both of those coating scenarios are enhanced. So how does one produce a coating that protects where it ain't, like galvanizing does? Well, step one is to select coating compositions that are more anodic to magnesium. Candidates that cover this criterion for most magnesium alloys, inclusive of phases in magnesium alloys, include gadolinium and lanthanum metal, with lanthanum being a safer bet. Such coatings can be deposited either by sputtering, but also via uh, electrode deposition in ionic liquids, as seen here, and there's uh, Jarek in the lab. Um, that is, in fact, in the top right corner, a uh, laboratory and something that many of us have not seen for a while. Um, an example of how lanthanum can electrochemically protect magnesium is seen here. And I have to admit, I never, ever, ever, ever get sick of watching this video. So what you'll see here is a half-coated uh, magnesium sample. And the dark area on the left um, is coated with lanthanum and this is immersed in a sodium chloride solution. The shiny area that you see on the right is magnesium alloy AZ91B. And what we see over a period of time in this video, um, I'm just gonna speed it up manually, is um, the uh, protection afforded by the film, uh, the lanthanum metal film, um, being uh, dissolved in a sacrificial manner. So this is a really, 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 really cool video. All right. So, but to accomplish a fuller protection system as reactive metals dissolve quickly, um, the following goals need to be fulfilled, as you can see. Um, just like zinc, uh, and, and this is the same in the context of zinc coatings and galvanizing, I may add. So to accomplish a protection system, we want to have an active coating, but we also then want to slow the rate of dissolution of the active layer by passivating that layer. So how would one do that for, for lanthanum coatings? It would look something like this, and then a smiley face next to it. Um, this is where prior work of Xiaobo Chen on phosphate coatings to directly protect magnesium could then be translated and applied to lanthanum. And in fact, lanthanum actually rapidly forms a phosphate film um, when exposed to phosphate solutions that are stable and passive, so to speak, across a very wide range of, of pH. So as we can see here, the plot on the left shows that phosphate coating has the ability to retard the anodic reaction upon lanthanum. Um, yes, you're seeing polarization data for lanthanum. And speaking of lanthanum, what you now see on the right um, video is you would have seen the electrolyte just get chucked in. Um, but the image on the right shows in a dilute chloride solution um, a piece of uncoated lanthanum on the very far right. And the sample that's darker, darker is a phosphate coated lanthanum. And what you can see in real time is the rapid dissolution of lanthanum uh, happening. And I don't know if the resolution is good enough on this downscaled video to show you the hydrogen bubbles flying off, but I will manually speed this up a little bit. You can see the aggressive corrosion that happens in real time on, on lanthanum metal. It's more reactive than magnesium itself. You can see hydrogen bubbles flying off the surface here. And what's amazing is that uh, on the lanthanum phosphate coated lanthanum is we see very little electrochemical activity and, and just a little bit of hydrogen evolving from uh, the edges of the sample that weren't, weren't ideally coated. So that's a, a proof of concept of um, anodic coatings for magnesium uh, alloys. But um, even though I've shown some examples of thinking outside the box and corrosion protection for magnesium, um, many samples still remain. Um, although they were fun examples of, of taming the wild metal, which is magnesium, so to speak, um, recent work by Mohsen Esmaili uh, that, that he kicked off, um, and Mohsen's now working in industry and we're continuing with, relates to the performance of additively manufactured magnesium alloys, where the range of production capabilities um, varies uh, a whole range of different parameters now. So what's soluble, um, what are the potential applications of net shape magnesium and so forth. And also um, a current PhD student um, called Marzi Gorbani 
is addressing the chronically undercooked nature of magnesium alloy design using machine learning. And she's doing amazing things, looking at multiple properties simultaneously. But now to begin uh, a few minutes of summing up, I wanted to say a huge thanks to all the students and researchers that I've had the pleasure to work with over the past dozen or so years. Um, there's been quite a few of them, all of them exceptional, um, from the very first uh, to those still going, and I thank them all for taking the plunge, as most of them willingly worked with magnesium in the face of adversity and demonstrated how one may overcome technical challenges by design-directed approaches. So the faces that you see there, there's too many to name, are the ones that have just really worked on projects that relate to magnesium. Um, I also want to thank the many sponsors um, of the work of our group over the years and the researchers from the various organizations and universities that have collaborated with us, in particular Virginia, Shimi, Paris Tech, uh, McMaster, IRL, Ohio State, um, and the, the CSIRO, which is the National Lab here in Australia, and of course some of the marvelous industry partners that we've worked with. Um, very interesting things have been able to be done, and that's really because um, of not just exceptional collaborators, uh, but more importantly because of sort of exceptional people. Um, so most of the collaborators are seen in one foul swoop uh, in this image in the middle here, uh, taken from the ECS meeting in Phoenix a few years ago. Um, these collaborators have been a joy to work with, I think, because of the following reason. So I want to thank them for making it possible for, for me to be awarded the EuroLeague Award. And uh, I think the best summary I can give for these collaborators is that no individual ever sought closure or victory in anything. Nothing was ever really a competition. Um, questions were, were always posed for their own sake. Um, claims were allowed to be left unchallenged and differences were allowed to go unresolved. Um, this is not trivial because progress can be difficult and there have been many attempts to tear down the work uh, of the group over the years and most such attempts have, have been in a pretty incredible way. So in preparing this presentation uh, last week, I was reminded by a message that popped up on my LinkedIn feed that recalled the challenges faced by Dan Shetman that was uh, both not believed but also taunted when he claimed, correctly, that quasi-crystals existed. Uh, whilst the critique of the concept of corrosion-resistant magnesium was perhaps not critiqued to the same extreme level, I want to make the point that accepting incredible assumptions can, can really be a gateway to enlightenment. Um, there's no better example than when uh, Descartes uh, invented a non-existent and impossible number, the square root of minus one. It wasn't until a century or so later that Euler and Gauss showed how many crucial problems could be solved uh, if one is prepared to suspend disbelief for a moment. And so that's something that I encourage all of you to do. Uh, suspend disbelief for a moment when you're working and think about what, what is possible. Um, it may just land you on TV. Right? This is real footage, I swear. Um, but if TV isn't your thing, then there's always glossy magazines that also await too. So um, I'll put the jokes aside. And once again, I want to thank you. And again, huge thanks to the Electrochemical Society. Uh, the HH Ulig Award for me, um, and it's hard not to be emotional about it, is actually a career highlight. And I'm extremely uh, humbled uh, to be a recipient of this award. Thank you so much. Um, you can find me here anytime. Um, I look forward to hearing from you. Goodbye.